Good. Okay. So finally, we arrived to our last webinar, uh, our fifth webinar today. We've been through all this and we arrived to digital soil mapping in R. It's been a pleasure, I hope for you too. So today we will uh, have three parts. We will start by a brief introduction to soil mapping and conventional soil mapping. Then we will focus more specifically on digital soil mapping. And then we will have a session, a practical session in R, um, looking at the code and mapping uh, SOC, soil organic carbon in IAS basin with the profile data that we have already. So first of all, I would like to say that I am not a soil expert. First of all, I, I know you, you will probably, uh, Mustafa and others probably know much more than me about soils <clears throat> and I'm more a, an expert regarding statistical analysis. Um, but well, we all know how important soils are and this has been recognized by FAO and they deliver many ecosystem services. This is a nice in, infographic made for the International Year of Soils about all the soil functions and their importance. And this is why it is so important to have soil information in the context of land use planning and in um, integrated land use planning. Um, having so maps of soil characteristics and a, a good soil assessment will uh, be key to assess land suitability to support, for example, different crops or other land uses, and to finally determine an optimal land use scenario. And as we've seen in our last webinar, to uh, monitor degradation. And this is the methodological framework for land use planning that was, uh, this figure was developed by Haki and Soledad Bastidas. And as you see in, in this second uh, part of the methodological framework in which we assess the current situation, soil assessment is part of it. But of course, soil, soil information uh, is important to prioritize what to do, where and whom, and it's used along the methodological framework. So let's... Um, Let's see uh, first what, what is conventional soil mapping and how it, it's, uh, digital soil mapping is different from conventional soil mapping. So in this map from uh, IH Basin, what we see are different uh, land units which are discrete. So soil information in conventional soil mapping is represented in discrete units. And the boundaries, for example, when we go from yellow to violet, these are two different types of soils, the boundaries um, are very extreme. So changes do not happen gradually in these types of maps, but in, in, in, in sharp lines. So this is one difference from conventional soil maps and digital soil maps. Also, uh, they, in these types of maps, there is no quantitative information regarding the variability within each land unit. It's a discrete model of spatial variation. There are many examples of conventional soil maps. For example, the FAO World Soil Map, I think it's a nice example because it was the first World Soil Map and it took 20 years to produce it. And it was made with a collaboration of soil scientists from around the world. <clears throat> and these types of map took a lot of time to make in a lot of effort, a lot of fit something. And, and, and they include a lot of knowledge from the soil surveys, the, the people who, who do the maps. Um, well, and these maps are date from uh, many years ago. It's the, the first step towards ma soil mappings. Then, I'm approximately 30 years ago, geostatistics were introduced into, into soil science. And um, this concept of geostatistics 
uh, allows considering the autocorrelation of the data into mapping. What is autocorrelation? It's uh, how similar, for example, samples are and how this uh, changes when the, the samples are separated, are more separated, for example. So this, um, this approach maps the soil and considers the soil as a continuous uh, body, and it changes gradually in space. And these types of, I like this figure because it was made by Hannah, it was looking at Daniel Krieg, was the, one of the fathers of geostatistics, and uh, when he did his thesis, he did all the, all the um, figures by hand. Fortunately, when I did my PhD, I, ha I didn't have to do uh, the, the figures by hand. But what is representing this figure is a semivariogram. And these, these models, these functions, allow to model this spatial autocorrelation. Correlation. Actually, here we see the semivariance. This, this is a measure of how, um, how, for example, two sample points uh, differ, are different. And what we expect when there is a lot of autocorrelation is that as uh, the distance between these two sample points increases, the semivariance will also increase. So we will, we will, when we apply this uh, framework of geostatistics, the idea is to first build an empirical variogram, which are the points in here which we see. So we see all the pairs of observations that are separated at this distance, and we see the semivariance of all those pairs of observations. And then we fit a theoretical uh, uh, model they are different models. These are the basic parameters in geostatistics. And with this model, we model, <laughs> I'm repeating model a lot, we model the autocorrelation. And we can consider that to predict values. Because the point here is when we make soil maps or any maps, is that we cannot measure everything everywhere. So we need to interpolate. We need to predict values in areas where we haven't, when we, where we do not have measures. So how do we do that? How, we, how do we make that prediction? And that is where all these different methods rely. When we, in conventional soil mappings, well, you delimitate these land units and based on some observations and the knowledge of the, of the soil scientists, okay, you, you paint these polygons all in the same color and you're interpolating somehow, you're interpolating. <clears throat> With geostatistics in the interpolation, in the prediction, you also consider the autocorrelation, the dependency of the, of the data in space. <coughs> okay, so um, there are on all GIS software and in R, there are many libraries that allow to uh, use geostatistics. And what is great about geostatistics and the change is not only that it allows to map uh, um, variables with a continuous uh, frame, but also it allows to represent the uncertainty of these predictions. And this is very important. So soil geostatistics, geostatistical methods are also part of digital soil sampling. But there are other methods also that can be used in digital soil mapping. So what is digital soil mapping? Well, there are many de definitions, um, but basically the, the idea of digital soil mapping is that you couple the observation data, the field and the lab data, with environmental data, and you use a model to, uh, to couple this data, and then to predict any soil characteristic uh, that you are interested in, in other areas where you don't, do not have field measurements. So this will be digital soil mapping in a nutshell. So you have training data, for example, soil organic carbon, you have uh, measurements in different um, sample points. 
you have a lot of covariate that can be derived from uh, satellite data, for example, and that are important, that are related to soil forming factors. And you couple these two, you train your models and you use the predictive model to predict, uh, for example, soil organic carbon in your study. This is the basic idea of digital soil mapping. In ordinary cribbing, for example, you don't use these co covariates, not necessarily, in, there are many different ways, there are different, different models of cribbing. Some do use covariates, but some not. Okay, so let's take a, a look at uh, the training data. And this is what we were just discussing. No? Field sampling is essential for uh, digital soil mapping. There is a misconception sometimes that you do not need data or, or that you don't use uh, field data for digital soil mapping and that everything is done by the computing. And that is absolutely uh, not true because digital soil mapping is based on uh, the field data and uh, is not solely based on remote sensing. And field validation and local knowledge can also be used and are necessary and assets for digital soil mapping. And computing, as I was saying, does not replace profile description and lab analysis. Computing is a core tool for digital soil mapping and it, it takes the advantage of of the, the computing power that we have nowadays and all the available infor information it, uh, in digital soil mapping, that makes a difference and it's really good. And you take advantage of that availability of data and, and computing power, but you are based, always based on the data that you have from the field, from the lab and the knowledge. So for IS basing, uh, after this webinar, we are planning to have a, a training in which we will use data from IASH Basin, from the, the soil analysis that are being conducted. We have, I think we have seen these uh, maps before, but there are so soil profiles that were in 40 locations and many samples, almost, I, I think 1000 samples of probes in which different uh, variables were measured. <coughs> Uh, unfortunately, we the, the the the data for the soil probes is still not finished. I, the idea is to have it finished for the training so that we use IASH basin basin data. But the soil profiles are finished, and so today I will show you. We will see an example using this data. So when you uh, when you want to map uh, any particular, for example, soil characteristic for example, soil organic carbon or any other, the data preparation is the core of, of DSM. If you spend a lot of time preparing your data and also sometimes you use legacy data, data from other, other uh, service of, from other moments from many years ago and harmonizing the data regarding, for example, georeferencing and the units, the classification, the depths, etc., is a big part of the of the work. It's uh, the first step that we need to um, we need to do. So, for example, in in our uh, data set, uh, we are using these are the forty samples of the different uh, sample sites, the different profiles, and they have different layers. Some of them have one, two, three, four, five, uh, which are here in this map. We can see the number of samples in each sampling point. The ones in red are the ones that have six. In, in orange, they have five samples in each sampling point. And um, so how do, we, how do we harmonize this data? For example, for SOC, for soil organic carbon, there is a target depth that is uh, used, for example, for the global soil organic carbon map of FAO, which is the first 30 centimeters. So as you see, if I only use, for example, for this sample, 
the, the SOC that was measured in this, um, in this sample, uh, I will not be representing the whole 30 centimeters. So uh, a great tool for this to estimate um, any soil characteristic for a target depth are the splines, which are models that are fitted to the data and allow to estimate uh, the soil characteristic for uh, uh, any standard depth and also to fill gaps. And this way we harmonize the whole data. And adjusting a spline, uh, here we see a figure <coughs> that shows in, in how, for example, you can model how a characteristic changes with depth. Um, we can obtain, uh, for example, SOC for the, third, for the first 30 cent centimeters in all the sampling points. So another thing, for example, for SOC that we will see now in R, how we, how we did it, is that uh, to model and to map a stock you need to uh, estimate it. And for that, you need not only the carbon concentration, but also the bulk density and stone content, which in sometimes it's not measured, so you can also estimate it. So I did this. I here are the results for IH basin for um, soil um, for organic carbon stock for the first 30 centimeters. And as you see, we have 40 samples and the mean value is for uh, 4.1. And this is organic carbon stock in kilograms per square meter. And here is a very big important issue to consider. We, are, we will be using in this exercise only 40 samples. This is very low for digital soil mapping. And so it's more like an exercise or an example uh, at, at least 100 samples are needed to obtain reliable results, but this is what we have about for soil organic carbon because soil organic carbon was not measured on all the uh, probes. It was only measured in the profiles. So here we have each point is, is uh, reflecting the amount of uh, organic carbon stock uh, in red, we have the lower values, and in blue, we have higher values. So what we want to do is we want to have a map in which we do not see points, but we can predict from these points soil organic carbon in other areas. Um, one first step is to see, for example, um, how if we are going to use, for example, land cover and the soil, soil classes, so the soil map and the geological map as covariates, we need to see how our sample, our 40 points, are represented in the classes of these maps. This is uh, very important as a first exploratory um, analysis of the data. And you probably already know that most of the samples, even though um, IH Basin has many land covers, uh, most of the samples of the profiles were done in arable land. So 37 of the profiles were in arable land, that is 93%. One was in permanent tree crop and two were in permanent shrub crop. So these are the only um, land covers that are represented in our data set. Um, I was also checking about the, the soil map, the different soil classes. Most soil types were represented in our third, in the 40 profile, profiles, soil profiles. And there is also an, a geology map available for IH Basin. And most of the, also of the classes were represented. Some were not, but the, the, the most important issue here is land cover because if we will use land cover to train our model and to predict, um, here we have to make a decision and it was, okay, we will only predict in arable land, permanent shrub crop and permanent tree crop because in the grasslands and in the forest where we do not have samples, uh, we already know that many soil characteristics change a lot with land cover or land use. 
And so it's not appropriate to um, interpolate or predict in those areas. We will go back to this later. So the first big important step that is to um, harmonize the data and prepare the, the data set uh, we, we have seen. Now we will see a little bit about the covariates and uh, why we do we use covariates and, and how. So digital soil mapping is based on this uh, notion that there are uh, that any attribute or a soil attribute can be predicted from uh, these factors, the soil forming factors. This is a mnemotechnic, um, the scorpion function that what is saying is that soils, any, any unvisited site, okay, it is, uh, can be predicted from the soil information that we have, for example, soil maps or soil legacy data, or nowadays also there are other uh, information available from uh, remote sensing can also be used. Climate, climate uh, has a big influence on soil properties. Organisms, this includes land cover and uh, the vegetation. Relief topographic variables are a key, of course. Uh, Current material, it influences the chemical composition of the soil and other characteristics of the soil, age, time, and location. And of course, a, a series, a, a random uh, um, component related to the residuals and is usually out, also autocorrelated residuals. So, here is where all the previous webinars also <laughs> make sense in this context. I don't know if you've seen the videos from our first webinar. There were three videos. The last one was a, a, like an introduction to all the tools that we were going to see. And in that is, webinar, we said that a digital soil mapping is a, um, something that integrates all these different tools because for uh, obtaining these covariates that relate to climate, uh, relief, uh, uh, land cover, etc., we can make we can use uh, GIS and Google Earth Engine. We've seen in this webinar all the available data that is uh, in the cloud and that you can download and use, and also uh, other monitoring indexes that we've seen in last uh, uh, webinar. So uh, within the project, we've been building a GIS database using uh, uh, many layers of information, including many layers of information for AS racing. One of them is a soil map that uh, uh, we didn't do it, of course we did it. And a geological map, this will be used for mapping SOC. Now we will see. Also climate, there is a, a world database with 19 bioclimatic variables from World Clean, which has a one kilometer, square kilometer, one kilometer resolution. And these 19 variables are related to temperature, mean temperature, seasonality, the maximum and minimum of the of different uh, quarters or months, and the same with precipitation and it's very easy to download and use and it's available. We have a lot of uh, digital elevation models available, 30 meter, 90 meter, where for IAS there is the 10 meter uh, DM. And from this uh, information about the, the heights, we can derive other variables, other variables like the uh, aspect, a, a slope, and also we saw in, in the webinar of Google Earth Engine that there are other um, available uh, indexes, topographic indexes, the landform, the Chile, uh, the well, there are many other indexes that uh, describe the relief in different ways. And that can also be used in this context. 
And regarding organisms, well, there is a land cover map for IH basin, and we can also use, uh, for example, mean annual NDVI as another uh, predictor and an, or another covariate. Okay, so with once we have this um, GIS database, we need to decide where we will predict, uh, for example, in our case, soil organic carbon. And for that, we need a prediction grid. In, for this exercise, we made a prediction grid uh, made of hexagons, one hectare hexagons, each hexagon is one hectare. And for each of these hexagons, which uh, there are uh, approximately 115,000 hexagons, because that is the area in hectares of the basin, we <clears throat> obtain the, the information regarding all these uh, covariates from the GIS. In the case in which we have a vector maps, for example, land, the land cover map of IASH and the soil map and the geological maps are Biz duyuyoruz. Biz duyuyoruz. Ben yastım ama şey cevap gelmiyor. Sizden ses çıkmayınca herhalde bıraktı gitti. Uh, o zaman Ingrid, hello Ingrid, you are off, we can't hear you at all. Ingrid, hello, hello. Ingrid, we can't hear you. Hello, Ingrid. Muhtemelen tekrar bağlanacaktır. İnternetin de bir sorun var. Geldi herhalde. Evet. Geldi. Yeah. Sorry, I had a power camp at home. I don't know what I love. Okay, I will go back. Döndü, evet. Interpretation, there it is, sorry. Did you see this slide? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Good, okay. Yes. Okay. Just one second. There we are. Okay, we've been having a lot of fires uh, near my house and, and a lot of problems with the electricity. Okay, so, uh, well, I will go briefly. So we made this grid to predict uh, soil organic carbon. Each Hexagon has one hectare, and for each hexagon, we extracted information of each of the covariates from the GIS database. So, what do we do with all of this information? So, you can imagine we have a you can imagine it as a map or as a a, a, a table, a data table in which for each point we have the value of SOC 
and also the value of all the covariates, that's our training data. And then we also have a table <clears throat> for each uh, row. We have uh, one of these hexagons and we have all the information of the covariates, but we do not have SOC. So we need to predict SOC for each of these hexagons using the covariate data. And for that, we need to use a predictive model. There are many predictive models that are used in the DSM context. For example, as I was saying before, also, I will, sorry. Um, so we can also use geostatistical models such as uh, Cochrane and regression Cochrane, which is very nice because it, it uses uh, um, multiple regression to model, but also the residuals of this regression are uh, used for the prediction using a uh, creeding, using the autocorrelation of the data <clears throat> as input data too. And we can now we can make use of all the data mining techniques and the machine learning method, methods that are available. These methods are great because <clears throat> they do not have um, assumptions on the data. And, and this is very important because in geostatistics, you do have some uh, assumptions. Um, random forest, uh, support vector machines, and many uh, algorithms are used for data mining. Random forest being one of the most made the um, the uncertainty of the estimations. So we can also map the uncertainty of the estimations. And data mining is uh, algorithms are really uh, good for these uh, scenarios where we have hyperdimensional spaces. That means like a lot of covariates that we can use. It extracts the relevant information from all the available data. <clears throat> so here is the results from the prediction using random forest and the, the SOC data. As you can see in this map, uh, there are some parts that are in white, and this is where there is no prediction of soil organic carbon content. And these are the hexagons that are, for example, grasslands or other land uses that we are not representing in our, in our sample. So here the prediction was done only on arable land uh, permanent shrub crops and permanent tree crops. <clears throat> and um, blue is related to higher values of soil organic carbon content. <clears throat> um, well, and you can see then we can look at it in the in QGIS, we can zoom in, zoom out. Uh, the, that in these areas, the, the, for example, here in the irrigation valleys, in these areas, we have uh, higher levels of soil organic carbon, and here we have lower levels. <clears throat> and if, if using this prediction, uh, 2 million tons uh, of soil organic carbon were estimated for uh, this type of lands in IH Basin. The prediction error, this is also a very important step after you model and after you predict, you need to validate your model with 40 samples, this is really uh, uh, just an exercise. Uh, we should have much more samples, but uh, you can have a, you can make a cross validation, for example, and estimate the error in your predictions related to the mean, for example, and that would be 27% for this. And uh, still, we need to. There is something in the chat. Um, Mustafa, if you if you want to ask, is this that a question? I think it's so. Uh, so is this is this map only for those between the depth of zero to thirty centimeters or not? Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, yes, what we did was to uh, with all the profile data, we harmonized the data and only extracted the value. Uh, uh, for this first uh, 0 to 30 centimeters. 
And uh, well, I didn't map the uncertainties, I should, um, for this, you need to uh, adjust, for example, the quantile regression forest algorithm. And um, here is a common random forest. And that you can, can see is the importance. It's kind of like the importance of the different variables that were used. These are the variables are used. Bio are the bioclimatic variables. This is a topographic index, NDVI, the mean of NDVI, the soil map, the, the elevation, slope, uh, EV, the geological map, another topographic index, um, and the um, land cover. Is there another question in the chat? My connection is unstable. Yeah, probably because I'm connecting from the phone, but can you hear me? No? Yes, thank you. Okay. You're good, yeah. thank you. I'm very, very sorry about the connection. We are still without power. Um, fortunately, I have battery in my computer. <laughs> okay. So um, this is the map we were just looking at. And here is another map I did only using Kriegen, ordinary Kriegen. And this is a geostatistical uh, The, this is a geostatistical um, estimation. I, I just um, fitted a semi-variogram to the data and predicted the values using Kriging, ordinary Kriging. Uh, I will not show the semi-variogram because it's, it's really not nice because it's only 40 data points, so it's very difficult. But uh, the, the general pattern, as you see, is, is, uh, is, is similar Although here we, we see more variability and that is respecting the natural discovariates that we were using. Here I didn't use covariates, here I did use covariates. And I wanted to compare with the other from maps from global products such as the GSOC map. And <clears throat> here you can see that it's very different because for, for this map you have higher values in this area than here and we obtain um, not necessarily this pattern. Uh, the, the map that we obtain is more similar. Um, here we can see <clears throat> in yellow higher values of SOC. This is the map from soil grids. The, and, and as you can see here, we can also see these irrigation valleys, probably because they used NDVI or other um, data that is forcing um, to, to show this pattern but also they obtain higher values of SOC organic carbon in this area, which we did not. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's, let's do the demo session in R. Let's go to the hard part and as an um, introduction to the training. I also wanted to mention that there are technical manuals made by FAO, which are available in these links. And you can, here you have all the code and a lot of information and you can base yourself and uh, you can base and, on this and, and are very easy to follow. There is this for soil organic carbon and there is also this for salt affected soils because digital, we will be using soil organic carbon today but um, you can use of course this technology for mapping any uh, soil uh, attribute. Okay, I will go to our studio, share. Okay, so this is our studio. If, if do you have, I would like to know if, if you have experience with R, if you can put it in the chat, I would appreciate it so that I know um, how much you've worked with R. Can you hear me? Can you 
hear me? Yeah, it's all good. Okay. So, yes. Okay. So, uh, how many of you have worked with art software? Most of us says no. Okay, good. Okay. So, I don't see any more, uh, any many, any other uh, answers, but R is really, really, uh, it's a great uh, statistical software, it's free. You can use it for, okay, many have, okay, good, good, good. And there are libraries for almost everything that you would like to do. And this is R Studio. You need to program and learn to program a little bit. Um, okay, okay, many have, good, good. You have experience, great. So this is R Studio, and when I started using R, R Studio didn't exist. Made my life much easier now. And I will open the code I prepare. It is this one, as you can see. And um, okay, let's start. So these are the libraries I will be using. And this is where I have all the data. I, I, I prepared the, remember that we saw that the first big step is the data preparation. So I prepared the, it, the, it was not that hard because it's only 40 samples, but you need to specify which is the upper limit and which is the lower limit of each horizon in the, in the data. Um, and so I prepared that. That is this data, data, uh, it's called SOC. So here I will read the data <clears throat> and I will um, specify which are the spatial coordinates. And okay, here is this, this is because when you estimate a, a stock soil organic carbon stock from bulk density and from stones, um, you need to, to have SOC in percent. But uh, when, you, um, when you calculate, uh, um, but then you need to have it uh, in per mil. So I made a new column in my data set I, and here with this function depths, what I'm making is from this, the data, I'm changing it into making, creating a soil profile collection object. This is a type of object, especially for a soil analysis. If you don't have a experience with R, don't worry. I mean, this is only a webinar, it's just to show uh, quickly how things uh, work. In our training, we will go um, deeper on each of these things and with an introduction on, on what we, how we code in R, a little bit of that. As you can see here, I have my code and every time I create an object or read an object, I can see it here in the environment. So now my data, my data, my object, called data is a soil profile collection. And data court is a, a, has three variables and 40 observations. <clears throat> okay. And here I see I, I haven't had any errors so far. So here, this is the spline fitting with this function in R, these are functions. And here we give the arguments between brackets to the functions and we say over which data set, which variable from the data set. And here is where I specify that I want to estimate a SOC in this um, from zero to 30 centimeters depth. Okay. The spline function will not do it if, uh, if, for a, uh, if we have only one sample, if we have only one depth, it cannot estimate anything. So it, this is what it's telling me here. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, in with this, uh, in which I will put these uh, characteristics, the, the coordinates, the, the, um, the name of the site, SOC and SOC permit. So this is where I'm preparing my training data set. This is to eliminate empty cases. Okay, so I need to estimate bulk density because I do not have it. And this is what I was uh, trying to explain before. To estimate bulk density, we will use this uh, method, Saini, uh, there are different methods here they, they are, but we will use this one. And for that, to estimate bulk density, which is something that I need to calculate the uh, stock of soil organic carbon, I will estimate it using also SOC data, but in percentage. So here are the uh, uh, the commands to estimate bulk density. As you see, bulk density is BLD. I named it BLD. First, I say that there is no bulk density data, so I create, you know, this column. Here, I estimate it. Uh, um, with the method, with this method, sorry, not the other one, with this method. And now I will have a, the a BLD column in my data set. You always need to check that this is okay. So you can, if you ask a summary for, for this, here we can see. Can you see or should I make it bigger, maybe? No one is complaining, maybe it's okay. But here we have the minimum, we have the maximum, we have the mean of bulk density. It uh, shouldn't be lower than zero and not higher than, uh, than two. I see it fine, okay, good. Um, Let's see an histogram of the bulk density data. Here we can see it. <clears throat> this is the, the, the way to, to plot an histogram with east. And you can specify how many breaks. If you want even less breaks in your histogram, you just change it like that. And you have your histogram. So, we have SOC data, we have now bulk density data that we estimated from the SOC data using uh, this method. And um, the coarse fragment data, which is uh, named like this, I will name it like this, uh, is also not available for our data set. So we will set it to zero. We will say that it is all zero, but we need to run this. So from our coarse fragment data, our bulk density data, our stock density, our stock um, data, we will now estimate the carbon stock. And this is where you need to be in per mil. And that is why I will use here this column, you see, so per mil. And I will use this function and create estimate that. Everything is going smoothly. Now let's see uh, what we have. <clears throat> As you see, the mean is, is 4.1 for our data set. And uh, as I said before, this is carbon stock in kilograms uh, per square meter. So if you want to change this into a tons per hectare, you need to multiply it by 10. So it's actually 40 tons per hectare or four kilometers, a kilograms per meter. Okay, so here we are working with our training data set. Remember that it was the square meters, yes. This is, a, we are working with our 40 samples. And I can uh, 
I can write this and obtain this data set uh, and write it and have it in my in my folder. And here, for example, we can see these values, how they, uh, um, the, the density, the distribution of the values. Sometimes this is skewed in uh, right skewed. So then you need to apply a, a transformation, a logarithm, logarithmic transformation, but this is not our case. So we will leave it like that. We can see here the distribution of uh, organic carbon stocks in our data sets. As you can see, the N is 40. It's our 40, 40 profile data, 40 sites. Okay, here we would load this library in our, as I said before, you have different libraries we have di which have different functions. The library raster, uh, allow us to work with a uh, raster uh, data and we will work with the covariates. I will just do a couple of things because I actually did this part in QGIS. I use, uh, I complement uh, R with QGIS or any GIS, <clears throat> but you can do everything in R if you'd like. This is the, uh, the shape file in which I see the borders of IASH, there are no, well, uh, the, this error or these warning messages are because of the, uh, the versions at which uh, the, the, the packages were built on the version of R that I have. It's, this is not important at all. And for example, here you see I have, it's very easy to load a rastered image. I have the, the, the DEM uh, at 30 meters um, in, in a TIFF and you just uh, So first you plot the DEM and then you, uh, oh, you put the, the limits of IASH and you can see it here it's loaded. And like this, we can do it with different uh, covariates. But I will not do it all here. Here, for example, we create a stack for the climate variates, variates um, covariates, because the world clean, you know, you have different bands. So you, you create a stack in R to see the different bands. And these are the names and what each uh, bioclimatic um, variable is about. For example, the number one, bio, the bio one is the annual mean temperature and bio 12 is the annual precipitation. For example, uh, I will not, well, let's do it. Here I can load this. <clears throat> Can you hear me well? I think the light is, I will connect from, from home, I think, just one second. Sorry for this. Okay, now we have power back, it should be okay. Okay, so here I loaded all the climatic data and I will plot these two variables, these four variables, um, which is annual uh, temperature, the seasonality in temperature, <coughs> um, annual precipitation and uh, seasonality in precipitation for IAS raising. Okay, so now I need to link uh, in our table in which I have the soil organic carbon content, content to the covariates. And that is what I will do here because I, I already prepared uh, this table 
with the covariates, as I said, in the GIS, which is called profile data. And here I can see a summary. So now I have a lot of variables in this. Um, this is the land cover. As you can see, uh, it is uh, in a con continuous here. It's a numeric variable, so I will need to change it to a um, to a categorical variable for land cover, geological map, and soil map, and all the others also are also numeric variables. This is what I will do here. I will change them into factors. I need to merge the data, the SOC data, with the covariates. And here I will change all my variables that are uh, numeric here to factors. And they are numeric because I rasterize them first. OK, so now, as you can see, let's go back. Here you see this is telling me that land land cover is ma majority because it's the majority of the for is um, categorical. Okay, and this is the prediction grid. I will upload it. Oh no, sorry, here. Yeah. Um, from a, an Excel file, which is an Excel file in which I have an ID for each hexagon and all the covariates for each hexagon. As I said before, I did it in, in the in GIS. I will also change each of the um, of these variables, make them uh, factors, categorical variables, and I will check that the names in the grid are the same as the names in the data set it is telling me here that the first are not which is okay because the first are um, the id this is the, the the data of the location of each hexagon the left and and right and top and bottom from each hexagon so i will not have these in my in my data set these variables in my data set but all the rest which are the covariates have the same name in both data sets. That is very important because uh, if we are going, we are going to train the model in our data set and then we will predict in our grid, we need to have the, the variables, the covariates with the same name. So this is may look and also we need to check, we need to also, what am I doing here? I'm checking that the levels of a uh, land cover for example, are the same levels in the in the grid because the the algorithm will not work if I have, for example, of course, if if in my training data set, in my profile data, this is what we have seen with the pie charts before. If in my profile data, I have um, samples. Uh, I do not have samples in in grasslands, and then in the grid, I have hexagons that are in grasslands. It will not work because it, it, that level of, of that variable is not representing in my training data set. So I need to take care of, I need to check that beforehand. But the other way that I run also happens. So I need to check that also there are not levels in the, in, uh, in the data set that are not present. Uh, so I take it for each of these categorical variables. Let me look at the time, I don't want to take too much time so that we have time for questions. Is there a question in the chat? Is there a uh, Mustafa? Do you have a question? You can you can interrupt me. Don't don't please do not uh, worry. Okay. So now ben we have our can I ask something? Sure. Of course, the values from 40 points in a huge area, it's represented nicely. Can you 
Can you provide the data in percentage in terms, not in kilograms or something, but in percentage? Yes, we can. We could uh, model uh, SOC in percentage. Yes. Um, we can do it in in. Hani ben in, e, hesap yaptım yanlış it, olmazsa. I did it like this because it's comparable to the global solar organic carbon mass. Uh, but he, he was talking over you. I'm sorry, Ingrid. Can you come over? Uh, and he wants to say something. For in one square meter, uh, 1.25 grams per centimeter. When we do it this way, there will be 37.5 uh, kilograms uh, soil weight. So looking at your uh, figures, I think it was four kilogram uh, organic carbon or something. So uh, this is this is too big, I believe, in average. The, the area might be small, but I think this average is too high because, you know, especially in nitrogen fertilizer, this is how we do the calculations and 80% uh, of the Turkish soil uh, comes with very small organic matter and it is also true for the organic carbon that is why the, the, the figures that you show the average number seems to be so high to me what do you think well it's what the what is in the data but if you see um in terms of in terms of Hector, you're right, but when we turn it to Duckers, uh, still I believe it is high. Well, I'm, I, I, this is only arable land, right? It's not uh, the rest of the land cover, so that is that could also be uh, one of the reasons. Here we do not have any bare areas, any other land types are not represented. It's only arable land, tree crop, and um, and shrub, run, shrub crops. But I specifically checked that it was consistent with what is in the globe soil, soil organic carbon map. And if you multiply this by 10, you will obtain it in tons per uh, hectare. So here is kilograms per square meter. So if you multiply it by 10, you get this in tons per hectare. So it would go from, from two to four or, or, or three to five. Yes, he, in this uh, scale, yani in, in tons per hectare, it will go to I agree with you when it comes to the scale, no problem with the scale, but still the values found, I believe, are high in Ayash region, in Turkey in general, especially in arable lands in Ayash, organic carbon, I believe the average organic carbon in this percentage is like 0.8 percent. Yes. That is, is what I believe the, and those, I know. Those were the values in percentage, indeed, yes. Yani bunu şey we can take a look at the bunları. data if you'd like. But yes, the, the values in percentage were point, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. But when you transform it to stock, these are the, the, the scale changes a lot. And it's consistent with the other um, soil organic carbon maps. So maybe there is a... Um, so this is carbon stock, it's not in percentage, it's different. Of course, too, when you when you model carbon stock, you use bulk density and you use uh, the coarse fragments. Since we didn't have that data, I had to estimate it with what we have. So maybe if we had that data, we could better adjust the the stock from the per, the soil organic carbon in percentage. And maybe that is a a, a source of. We had the stone values in Ayash. Once you have data from the probes, I think you're going to have them. Okay, good, good. And when then we can maybe match the Thank stone you. value data to the SOC data in the profiles and use it to better estimate uh, SOC. Yeah.
But yeah, the values oh. of percentage were, as you said, in, in that uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. But when you change it to stock, these are the, this is the scale. Okay. I will share again. We'll go back to the R. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Okay. So let's go now to the, to the modeling itself. So we have the SOC data. We have the a covariate data. Now we need to train our model. And here, <clears throat> these are the variables, the covariables I chose. I didn't put all the bioclimatic variables. I chose the ones that I consider less redundant. For example, for that, you can do a principal component analysis and see which are the less correlated variables. Or you can use your knowledge I'm sure this could be much improved and other variables could be included. And for this, we use the library Caret, which has a, a lot of machine learning uh, functions in there. It uses other libraries. And it's really useful for digital soil mapping. So here I'm specifying which is the dependent variable which is the carbon stock, which are the independent variables, uh, which are the covariates, all the covariates. I will run this part of the script. Here is loading the libraries that are required. Okay, all is in order. Okay, and here, this is one of the parameters used for random forest, which is the number of, um, of variables that uh, are used in each of the trees. I will not go deep into what random forests do. We can also take a look at this later, but uh, it is a forest. <laughs> so you use many decision trees in a random forest and you use a, a specific number of variables for each uh, tree. So you can use uh, here, I'm saying that you can try it with these different numbers of variables. It is one of the parameters that you need. So I'm specifying these parameters here. Uh, and here, this is the function in which I uh, fit or train uh, and create the, the, the random forest model. This is the, it worked well, everything is in control. And here I will create this uh, graph, but uh, in plot is the plot in which you see the importance of the different variables. Uh, it's not importance per se, because um, it's, it's actually, it's a measure that is called node purity and it reflects um, because these decision trees um, in each node, you separate your data by one variable. So if, this, if the true groups that are uh, created have internal purity, that means that they are uh, more um, homogeneous within each group, uh, you have more node purity. So this is what this graph is uh, showing us. This is the one that was in the presentation. <clears throat> okay. And this, is, this graph is also important because we see if it stabilizes in, with a different number of trees. So we have, we made this algorithm with different number of trees. And as you can see, if you use not many trees, uh, it is not, the, there is a lot of error. So you need to check, but with, I. 200 trees is enough. We use 500 because it's the default. That is, I didn't specify this parameter. It's another important parameter in random forests, but um, the default is 500. And, and with this graph, we see that it is enough. 
if we have a lot of error, we can uh, specify that we need more um, um, trees in our random forest. Okay. And here we predict. So here we take our grid and predict. You see how fast this is? It's just a second. It's, it's only, um, the grid has only, when you take out all the hexagons that have uh, other land covers, we have, I think uh, it's um, 54,000 hexagons. So it's 54,000 hectares approximately. So um, you make the prediction and it takes one second using all these variables. Um, okay, I will create a table and I can, uh, I can check if the head is okay. So I have the ID of each hexagon and the prediction here I have the uh, soil organic carbon content in kilograms per square meter. Okay, let me see what, okay, it's, it's already uh, 9.15. Here I have the code for a uh, Krieging, the, the other map that I showed and I will go fast. I do not want to show you the variogram. Okay, I will show it because it's really, really horrible because we have very little, um, little points. You see, here, this is what we, the semi-variogram. So what we, we expect to see is that at higher distances, we have more semi-variance. There is not much autocorrelation. Uh, as you can see, this is the fitted uh, semi-variogram. <clears throat> here we, uh, make the prediction with Krieging, with Krieg function. Here we have the code for regression Krieging, which we will not do today. And this is the cross validation. We can have a cross validation with uh, dividing our data set in two, for example, with this parameter, we decide that we will use 70% uh, of the, the data to train the model and 30% to validate it. We can change that to 0 0.8 or... But uh, since we have only 40 data points, it's, um, it's really... Uh, it's really bad, it changes a lot. So what we will do is a leave one out cross um, validation. Here we calculate the error, the prediction error. And you see it's 33, but if I do it again, it will be very different because the, the number of, you see 26%, every time I run it, it will give me a very different uh, prediction error. 23% because we have a very small data set. So uh, if we train the model, it depends on the, the, it's very dependent on the subset of data that is used for training the algorithm. So here I created a function to um, use a leave one out uh, both for, um, for the Krieging model and for the uh, random forest model. So here it is running. So what it, it is doing, it takes 39 um, samples, calculates, trains the model, predicts the, the one that was out, calculates the, the error and does the same uh, many times with all the samples, 40 times with the both models, with the random forest and the Krieging model. And, and then calculates the, the mean relative error. It will take a, 
a few more seconds. As when you when you have this here, you see this. It's because it is running. It is working. I can click there and make it stop, but it will not take much longer. And let's see. It should give us it this. If we do this many times, it will be very stable. Not like the validation, the cross validation I was doing before, in which I divide the data set in 80% and 20%, here it will be more stable. I will not do it many times because as you can see, it takes some time. And I will go to QGIS so that we can better explore our map and visualize our results. It shouldn't be much longer. <clears throat> uh, well, there is a question in the chat box, Ingrid. They're asking yes. whether uh, whether they can do taxonomic classification in digital soil mapping or not. So they say, as far as we see, we can do we can map only the soil characteristics in the digital soil map, or can we really do taxonomic uh, classification in the digital soil mapping? Uh, I think if, if I understood the question correctly, if you can, for example, use conventional soil mapping with the with the data set. So you can um, you can in in uh, if you have different uh, polygons, land areas land, uh, that you delimited previously, you, and they are consistent regarding different variables. Using this data, you can also characterize, for example, soil organic carbon and average those, those values for that uh, type of land. So there are different methods to do this. One is the class um, and referencing or the geo, uh, geo class matching and geo matching. These are two different uh, uh, methods, for example to do conventional mapping using uh, this data, for example, and the covariates and all the data. I don't know if that is what you were asking. Now, Ingrid, I have another question, actually, if I may. Yes, please. Well, the thing is, I wonder, uh, well, any parameter in soil is variable, but those variables are related to the stable parameters. So we see how the, how much there is change when you try to relate a, a varying thing to a stable thing. This is about Kriging and all that is. But soil mapping is something different, I believe. Soil mapping is about taking samples from a certain depth, depth, and with a variety of parameters, you try to get a series of soil, series data of soil, and then you try to do taxonomic classification in the soil by doing digital soil mapping. This is what we wanted to see, actually. Can we, by using digital soil mapping, can we do taxonomy, taxonomy, uh, classification, taxonomy classification in soil or not by doing digital soil mapping. So you mean like your your your dependent variable will not be a continuous variable, it will be a class. That, that, that is what you want to do. Uh, Mustafa. Uh, do you know about taxonomic classification in soils? Tax, because what you are showing is nothing to do with taxonomic classification. Let's no, say because in, in general, you you you try to model variables that are the. This is why we had this in first introduction, in which uh, our goal is here is to map different uh, soil characteristics, not taxon, not uh, not classify soils uh, with a taxonomical classification of soils. Uh, but to map different soil characteristics that might be very useful, for example, to um, in the context of land use planning, um, assess the land suitability for different purposes, for example. 
and, and with the notion of that these soil attributes are continuous in space. It's like a different paradigm than this um, conventional soil mapping. You, you try to, to map uh, variables that are continuous in a continuous way. So you can map gradual changes with uh, it. Um, however, I, I really do not know if you can use DSM to, uh, of, uh, to, I haven't seen examples of what you are saying, but I guess that basically this taxonomical uh, classification of soils it's a, a, a variable that is categorical. Also, the different taxonomic uh, types of soils are a, it's a categorical variable. So you're here in, in, in, if you want to train a model to classify your soils in, in different classes, uh, you have a dependent variable that is not continuous, that is categorical. And there are models to do that, but um, <laughs> The family families of soil, for example, can we create families of soil? Soil taxonomy is about that, you know. Yeah. So you need to train your. The basic concept is that you need. Um, in that case, instead of SOC, if, because here our dependent variable is SOC, you will have the taxonomic uh, mm -hmm. classification of soils, right? That is what you want to model. You want to predict in an area where you don't know what type of soil you have uh, or, uh, or uh, the family yeah. or you, you want to predict that. You don't know and you want to predict it. So you want to use covariates to be able to predict that. So you have to train your model regarding that. And uh, I guess you can do it, but you would need to have a, first of all, you need for all your samples, you need to know which type of soil they are or, or which is the taxonomic unit they, they belong to. Is it, it, you know what I mean? The importance is of, okay, what, let me finish and we we'll go back to this. I think I don't understand. Because, okay. because in each horizon of the soil, well, let's forget about the 30 centimeters. There is this A horizon, uh, the lively horizon, the lively layer of the soil can be five centimeters or zero centimeters, or, I'm sorry, or 30 centimeters. You can't just depend on 30 centimeters. There might be A horizon, B horizon, AC horizon, etc. But the live uh, soil layer is, is different in each soil. So I think this depth should be should be different for each soil type i and i think for digital in digital soil ma mapping we can't do it there will be thousands of variograms if you try to do it and there will be thousands of stable uh, variable if you try to do it this way i haven't seen an example actually around the world so i, I was curious whether you have seen an example or not but you moved into organic carbon uh, Maybe you, I thought you wanted to start simple, then you would go into details of taxonomy. But as far as I, I see, uh, taxonomy uh, is not relevant in the, the, the digital soil mapping, and digital, digital soil mapping will not help with taxonomy classification, as far as I understand. Can I take the floor, says ha, uh, uh, Hake? Hake? About you? May I say something before? I um, actually I see it the other way around. You know, you consider the taxonomy to predict any soil property, that, uh, the, your target soil attribute. It, that is what is mostly done. I haven't seen an example of that, but I think it's very interesting and could be um, could be explored. But uh, it's different from what we are um, doing now. I will stop short so we can see. Yes, Haka, please. Very briefly, I understand your concern, Mustafa, I understand your question. But the thing is, in the conventional methods used by the ministry, 
because of the law, actually. So, uh, soil classification is done in the conventional methods by the ministry. So you are curious how you can do soil classification using the SM instead of conventional methods. Well, but, you know, the SM can be used for soil classification as well, I believe. But there are examples in certain countries about that. Uh, the next step would be machine learning, employment of machine learning techniques and certain computer techniques and do soil classification. You can do it because when you're doing the classification, you ask about you take soil parameters and, and, and train it into the model. Well, this can can be done using some digital data in hand. This is the simplest explanation I can give. So this is doable. What you're asking is doable. It can be done. And I can share with you certain documents, examples in English. So it can be done. But can we do it here right now? I, I don't know, because the depths that we employed was different here. But digital mapping today, digital mapping combined with additional techniques gives you an automated system with which will help you doing any classification, I think. So just bear in mind, I think you can do soil classification with this. I can share with you some example, exemplary documents later. Thank you. Imra and colleagues. OK, I understand, but we are not producing anything. Well, let me put it this way. Maybe for each parameter, including sock or, or clay or or sand or sand, producing maps for each of them separately, then combining them in a program may be possible. This is this is this way, but this cannot be done in a digital soil mapping. This is what I understand. I don't know which country is doing it, Emra, but I don't think this is possible in, in DSM. Uh, Ingrid, I interrupted you. I really beg your pardon. Uh, I just wanted to really uh, underline our concern and, and the expectation in the first place. We were expecting digital uh, soil mapping to be used in soil classification, but it was not the case. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you can use digital. I mean, when for soil classification, you probably you use many variables. And for example, you can use digital soil mapping to obtain maps of all those input input values that you use for soil classification. First, you can use also, I mean, you, you can definitely use a digital soil mapping to uh, have a soil classification. So first you can use digital soil mapping for all the uh, input variables that you need for that classification. So you can predict, for example, the different texture variables, the, the chemical variables, and you can create maps of all these variables. Then you can, um, then you can definitely use a uh, classification algorithm to classify every cell in the grid using uh, those variables, for example. But you need to have, a, what you also need to have is um, this model to classify uh, uh, data, to classify souls based on different data sets. You need to, to, to, to have a training data for that. So for your samples, you need to also classify them previously to train your model, for example. Uh, or you can have an unsupervised classification and then you, you decide which type of which group corresponds to which type of soil. But yeah, I mean you can do it. It's not the idea of this of this today's webinar or, or of the training, because the idea is to really understand and be able to create these layers of, uh, of continuous uh, maps of different soil characteristics. Then you can use that as input for any classification too. That is okay. You can do it. Okay, so um, before we finish, because we are already too late, I wanted to show you the map that we created for SOC, for example, how with more detail, you see that you have a color or a value for each hexagon. And the white hexagons are areas in which the land cover is not arable land. 
or three clubs or shrap, shrap clubs. So this is the grid that we created, you see, and here is our predicted sock. And you can use it as a new layer. And the same with the many other uh, characteristics. So when we have the, the data from the probes, which we will have more data points and we will have other characteristics, we will create maps for, for each of these characteristics. That is um, what we have planned and what we intend to do. And what is digital soil mapping mostly used? Uh, because these layers are very, uh, these characteristics, these soil attributes are very important for, for the making decisions and achi achieving soil sustainable use, sustainable soil, soil management. Um, if you want to use them also to obtain uh, these maps, uh, this classification of the soils, you can also do it. And I will look into it and also try to find, to see if I find any examples about that. Good. Are any other more questions? No. Okay, so. Ben bir şey sormak istiyorum. To... Yes. I have a question. Evet. Ya so far, we've been working with FAO on the Ayash Basin. As a soil expert, I'd like to say that it's all about bringing different parameters and creating maps. So whatever you are explaining now, they can be done in different ways and different methods. And we're actually applying these methods. It's either you misunderstood our institution or we misunderstood you. So the, the words promised in the beginning were different, but uh, now I am expecting the response to our expectations in the beginning. Okay, yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe Sarah or Haki, if, if you can I help with this, because the idea um, of these webinars, since was to give tools, we are in a project that is about integrated land use planning, and we need in this part of the methodological framework, we, we cannot do the whole um, process within the context of this project, and we are basically focusing on these first steps, which are uh, at this stage at least, uh, which are um, assessing different. Um, Can I say something? So far, whatever has been done is not a training, it's about raising awareness and giving information about different tools. This is not called a training. Can I take the floor? I guess Ingrid has mentioned since the very beginning, has been mentioning since the very beginning, as Mustafa mentioned also, it's about raising awareness about tools. And this is a plan of the training. We wanted to show what kind of tools we will be using during the trainings, what kind of data we can use during the training. And and we were planning to raise capacity and increase capacity. If you think that all the variables, if we, we should be discussing the results based on all different variables. So this is something we have to still think about and we have to shape it together. But the trainings, I do understand. I do understand you actually. I, it's good that you're raising your concerns and I see your excitement and your expectations. That is good. And we can deepen our work depending on the need. But the purpose here, uh, one 
the purpose of what Ingrid has been explaining. It's not about showing the maps. It's because we have to do a lot of preliminary work. We unfortunately cannot go to the field. This was not the purpose of this webinar is as Swat mentioned, it's about raising awareness. Yes, it's about increasing capacity about various tools and uh, different methodologies and different uh, tools to provide this basic logic on different parameters. So what is important in digital soil mapping is to ensure the quality of each thematic tool. And then once you approve and verify the quality, you can create an algorithm to do the classification. So, and you can even create your classification system of your own. So classification issue is, let's say, it's one fifth of the entire task or entire work, then actually that's how you do in the field as well. You have to collect date the first. So you have to collect all different various data and parameters and then you harmonize them and then you provide and create an interpretation map. So it could be a different map. It could be a different classification for Turkey. It could be uh, private classification or own classification of Turkey, you can do it. So there are such examples. There is a simple way of doing it. For this series, let's say pH above this or below this, we have this and those parameters. You will just select the criteria and then within that series, you just create and classify. This is not very a complicated thing. So therefore that part can be done. Technically it's possible, but, and there are countries that do it. Maybe it will be interesting to you. India is one of the countries that is doing a lot of work on it and China as well, because these are big, huge countries in terms of geographical size. And these are the countries that need such systems. For example, Russian Federation is another case and is an example. So I can share the documents with you, but the purpose here it's not about interpreting the results. It was about showing the tools. And Ingrid has been doing her best to show them to you. You should not misunderstand us. It should not, we are not here to do the interpretation of the results. So, but we can discuss it still, but of course, you have to raise your expectations and concerns. That's important for us too. Uh, esteemed Emra, you are the person who would understand us most, mostly. I don't know how uh, good uh, Ingrid is with soils, but in the very beginning, when we were discussing, we were wondering what digital soil mapping is. And we wanted to know how, to what extent we can benefit from it. The thematic maps, we can create it ourselves. We do create them. Maybe they lack something, maybe they are not, not good, but we can create those thematic maps. Of course, we appreciate uh, everything that has been discussed and ha that has been presented here in terms of, I, of course, I increased my capacity. I just wanted to voice what was actually our expectation since the very beginning. Excuse me, may I intervene? Is it Hello? I, I believe you hear me right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chopsitin, for your uh, uh, question. I believe the the agenda of this webinar was uh, already shared with you. So I understand that uh, digital soil mapping or more technical uh, training is something you will be looking for, but. I believe from our side, we follow the agenda and what we have promised because this series of webinars have been agreed 
uh, with uh, the the ministry and uh, with our uh, colleagues, especially with Nurjan Hanum and uh, Ibrahim Bey. So I understand that maybe there might be needs for more technical interventions and technical capacity building. But the the idea of this series of webinars was basically to explain what we have done so far with the soil analysis and uh, what type of tools they are, as, as you saw. We also, I mean, uh, Ingrid is basically one of our best experts that we have for also statistical analysis. So you know that this was not only about digital soil mapping, but the whole process. And as you know, the, the project is about integrated land use planning. So we have relatively a small project and there are a lot of components. So within our capacity, considering also the online trainings and not being able to to visit in person. This was what we have proposed and was agreed by your side. So I think uh, the webinar that, that was uh, conducted was basically within our uh, promise that what we have, we have promised, we have basically fulfilled. Now, if there are any requests for future, uh, we are happy to hear that if it is possible within the context of our project and uh, we will be able to fulfill it within the remaining time. We are happy to hear that because a TCP facility is basically for capacity building and awareness raising. And for sure you have already a lot of capacity. So by no means we are here to tell you this is what we have to do or this is not. This is like a brainstorming and show you our process within the context of integrated land use planning. Now we are here to listen to any suggestions, as I mentioned, if possible within the context of project for remaining few months. And if it is not within the context of project, it's for sure something to be considered in future for other projects. Thank you. Let me say thing. It's about integrated land use planning. I do understand. But mapping and soil studies is the basis for this in project without addressing the, the without creating this basis you will not be able to do a lot in terms of integrated land use planning. That's my understanding of the situation. I'm sorry, I, I think I'm not very clear about what exactly is missing from our, our side. Okay. Mustafa Usul has already mentioned what is missing here and what were our expectations about the digital soil mapping. So it's about combined map mapping, taxonomy, classification by FAO. That was our expectation, but what you are explaining now is about creating thematic plan uh, maps. Sorry. Yes, that is what digital soil mapping is Absolutely. about. Creating maps of different soil characteristics, different soil attributes, which can definitely be used in the context of land use planning. I mean, not just soil taxonomy. Um, I understand what Mustafa said, and I think we can. Uh, I can look for examples for that. But to achieve that, and for a, a land use planning, if you can map different variables and, for example, use them for a suitability analysis, that is great. That is very important. You you don't you don't only need a, a, a soil classification. Uh, to ha a, a, that is not the only useful information. Having these layers, these maps, using digital soil mapping is... is
Sizin istediğiniz. I understand. But the data you are. Well, let me put it this way. Data I talk about, maps I talk about, Mustafa is talking about, are the maps which matter actually. So when you have the map that I talk about, you can draw any parameter from that map, including stone, including carbon. So I'm talking about general maps, general combined maps. Uh, soil classification maps, which can be used for any purpose. Actually, you can draw, you can withdraw any parameter from one of them, one of such maps. Okay, we can discuss this further. I think that if, uh, why would you, I mean, if you already have the parameters, yes, mapped, sorry, having each parameter map, mapped is, is having the raw data uh, instead of having the classification, but I think we can keep with the discussion. Uh, I think the important of what Sarah and Haki Haka are saying is that we are in a TCP project which is about land use planning. The soil assessment is key and is very important, uh, but it's part of this process of land use planning. It's, it's not the only part. And uh, even within this part of assessing the current situation, this series of webinars was a way to... Sorry, sorry, let me finish. Sorry, Emrah Erdoğan. Emrah, I think you understand me because you are the uh, most competent person in this topic here. Uh, so I think you can talk to Emrah later and uh, this question can be solved among yourself. Thank you very much. I don't be, I don't want to be uh, taking much of your time. Uh, well, there is no need to develop on this discussion, I think, any further, because as, as discussed, uh, different capacity building programs can be suggested and we can talk about it internally. A solution, it, we can try to find a solution. Uh, to meet your expectations. But as Sarah already said, this was the agreed agenda anyway. We were in coordination with the ministry when identifying this agenda in the first place. Maybe expectations changed in, in time, I don't know, since we identified the agenda, uh, because it's been some time since we identified the agenda together. Maybe your expectations changed in the meanwhile. I don't know, but we can talk it out talk it out later if a more specific specific detailed training is needed it's, activity is, is needed we can try and do our best if we can do it we, we do it this is it I don't want to really take much of your time uh, thank you I, I won't be talking any further I, I won't be taking much of any much of your more of your time I think Mustafa already left he, he lost them uh, he has a business to catch up, he said to me, says Suat. Uh, so he left. Okay, we can talk about it later then. Thank you. Thank you very much.